Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to you to this uh, wonderful Palm Sunday service as we begin our, our sort of season of Easter tide, and we're really excited about everything we've got in our program for Easter here at Worthing Tab. Um, my name's Rich, by the way. Did I say that? I didn't say that. I didn't introduce myself. That's very rude. I'm the pastor here. It's a privilege to lead our time together this morning, and I'll be preaching uh, on the Palm Sunday theme of the triumphal entry later on. Um, with regards to our Easter program, we do have these flyers, which you can use and use them for yourself to pray, to invite people. They're in uh, the desk in the foyer. And also, we have our final um, baptism course after the service this morning for those seeking to get baptized. On Easter Sunday, we've got five uh, baptismal candidates, praise God. Um, so we've got uh, um, Erica Habana, we've got Charmaine Scutt, Simon Silver, we've got Brian Chingoma, and we've got James Owen. So, happy days. God bless you guys as you prepare for your baptisms next week. We're very excited about that. Next Sunday will be a family service. Um, so everyone will stay in, everyone will be able to enjoy that time together celebrating new life and the baptisms of our friends as we think about Jesus rising from the dead and the joy that that brings to us uh, who know him. It's going to be a wonderful day next Sunday. In the evening next Sunday we have a praise service which will be in here as opposed to a, an evening service in the rear hall. 
because we're going to just praise God together uh, on Easter Sunday. Uh, on Good Friday, we have two services. We have a, a, a sort of fairly formal, solemn Good Friday communion service in, uh, in here in the morning at 10.30 on Good Friday. Uh, and then in the rear hall at 5.45, we have an evening service, which is our tenebrae service, where we look at the sayings of Jesus from the cross. And it's quite a, it's quite a moving service as we slowly uh, bring the lights down and blow out candles until the Lord's last breath is described. Uh, so do come along. It's a, it's a very reflective service, uh, the tenebrae service. Anyway, have a look at the sheets. Be praying, please, for Easter Sunday and the baptismal candidates. Uh, we are super excited about all of that. And finally, if you are interested in either serving at Holiday Club or registering your children who are school age, for Holiday Club in the summer. Uh, it's the 30th of July to the 2nd of August, um, and we are very excited about that. Again, forms, information, all at the welcome desk, or talk to Pastor Steve or myself and find out more about that. Well, as we come to begin our service this morning and we think through uh, all that it means as we begin to enter into the spirit of Palm Sunday, uh, here is a little call and response for us. It's going to come up on the screen as we uh, begin. We're going to say these words together, which come from Psalm 118. So, save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has made his light to shine upon us. Bind the feastal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give you thanks. You are my God, I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let's praise the name of Jesus. Stand and sing. Forever. 
Please do take a seat, and in a minute I'm going to ask Pastor Steve to help me with a little job that I've got for you little kiddos out there. Uh, today is Palm Sunday, and one of the things that we like to do as a church, as we think through what Palm Sunday is, what it means, is we like to give you a little gift, a palm cross, to help you to think about what today means. Okay, so the point of Palm Sunday that we're thinking about today, and all the adults are going to be thinking about this, boys and girls, I want you to listen to me this morning uh, as I tell you this. Palm Sunday does two things, okay? It wakes you up, and the lights go on, and we see Jesus. And we see Jesus, and we go, wow, look at Jesus. But then what happens is, Jesus turns the light on onto us. So Palm Sunday tells us loads about Jesus. It reveals Jesus, and it also reveals who we are. So when we have these palm crosses, and when we give them out to you guys, you need to remember that this is going to confront you. The cross will always confront you. Who you are, and who Jesus is. Okay? That's quite deep, isn't it? Who you are and who Jesus is. Jesus is the king who comes to take away the sin of the world. He takes away your sin. He takes away my sin. He's revealed to be the glorious saviour, but the cost is great. This is all happening on Palm Sunday. So Steve, if you could get the kids, come down. Come, come on kids, come on kids. You follow Steve. Well, don't follow him. Oh no, the box is there. All right, and um, while the kids come and hand around a palm cross to you, if you don't get one, by the way, just raise a hand. We'll make sure that happens. Uh, why don't you greet the people around you while the kids come and bring uh, a cross to you? Thank you, kids. Your help is much appreciated. Have any boys and girls gone upstairs to the balcony? George, you know what to do. Could you go to the balcony, George? Could you go upstairs? This, go, go to the back and upstairs for all the people upstairs. Right, if, has anyone not got one downstairs? Okay, there's a few over here. Good job. There's a few at the back there. Peter in the doorway would like one. Who's going to give one to Peter? There we go. Good job. George is upstairs. We're all okay. 
Everyone upstairs is going to get a cross. So the cross of Christ confronts us, doesn't it? It's something that tells us a lot. And, you know, this is what's happening on Palm Sunday. The people are being told all about Jesus, who he is, and what he's going to do for them. And that there's good things, but there's also very confronting things. That he has to pay for our sin. He has to overturn our lives. The lights go on. We see Jesus on Palm Sunday. All right. Well, thank you so much, kids. I think we're almost there. We have got a kids song for you. Um, and make sure, kids, you make sure you've got a palm cross as well. Take one home for someone at home if you need to as well. There's plenty more in the box for later. Um, so, kids, we're going to sing The Lord is King. And again, this song is talking about how the world can feel all upside down and topsy turvy, but Jesus comes and he makes it well for us. Thank you, guys. <laughs> seen bad things happening on the TV. You might be worrying about the world and wonder what will happen to you. Well, put your trust in God alone, because he's still sitting on his mighty throne. The Lord is King. Get sad and wonder why there's so much pain. Why we make the same mistakes happen over and over again. Our sinful ways will always fail, but God and His ways will prevail. Because the Lord is King, He's gonna look after everything, everything. The Lord is. This is his world. You kings be wise, you rulers, hear the Lord's decree. He sees, he knows, he'll judge, he gives some majesty. The best are all who find their place. Amen. Thank you, boys and girls, for all your help this morning, giving out the crosses and then keeping us in time with your drumming. Brilliant stuff. It's time for you little ones now to go to Crash and to Pathfinders. Um, follow the herd if you don't know where to take your children this morning. While the kids go out, let me uh, just say a little prayer for them. Oh, Father, we thank you and praise you for these little ones. That out of the mouths of nursing babes and infants, you have ordained praise. That these little ones can praise you in the highest heaven. In the sanctuary of heaven, their voices leading our voices in simple trust, love and adoration. Humble us, Lord, that we might have the faith of a child. That we might look to Jesus, our loving, saving, wonderful King and cry, Hosanna! Save us, O King, and praise the Son of David. O Lord, we thank you for our children. So as they go, may they learn. As they go, may they be well loved and instructed. Be with the helpers, the teachers, we pray. Lift up the name of Jesus in the midst of them. 
that they might know and adore him, the Savior, and help us continue as a church to praise your name in the years ahead. We thank you for them all. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. John and Linda, thank you both. Shall we come to God in prayer? Heavenly Father, we bow our heads and our hearts before you. Lord, we draw near with reverence and with all conscious, Lord, that you dwell in unapproachable light, that, Lord, you are worshipped day and night by the heavenly host. You are holy, Lord. Father, you're worthy of all praise, all honour, all glory. <clears throat> Father, you deserve all our praise. There's no God like you. <clears throat> Your word says that heaven cannot contain you. Even the highest heavens cannot contain you. Lord, there is no one like you. And yet you are willing to bend your ear to listen to us. Lord, we believe that you delight in hearing from us. Thank you, Lord, that you hear our faintest cry. Lord, your word tells us that your thoughts towards us are more than the grains of sand. And Lord, it seems to me that that means that we are never out of your thoughts, never <clears throat> away from you so that we are on our own. Thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your mercy and your steadfast love. Lord, we've been thinking about Jesus going towards Jerusalem on a donkey, knowing, Lord, all that was ahead of him, knowing that the accolades being heaped on him would be short-lived and that he would be done to death on the cross. We thank you, Jesus, for the sacrifice that you have made. Lord, thank you that because of that, we have entrance to our Father in heaven. And Lord, we thank you so much. Lord, we are conscious of our shortcomings. We want to honour you with our lives, Lord. We want to please you. And yet we're conscious of the, the bias that's in us that leads us to sin. Lord, thank you that you understand us so completely. You're willing to forgive us as we confess our sins. Thank you, Lord, that when you forgive them, you remove them as far as the east is from the west. They're remembered no more. Lord, we tend to cling to them still. We tend to go back to them like a sore place. Help us to leave them with you, Lord, to remember that they are no more, that you've forgiven us. Father, your word tells us that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just. You'll forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Help us to draw closer to you regularly, Lord, to confess our sins and know the, the blessings of a new start. Amen. Father, we want to just carry on in that spirit of thanksgiving. Thank you for that finished work upon Calvary, that our Lord Jesus Christ could say, it is finished. The work of salvation had been wrought in both heaven and earth, and that, Lord, we have that place where we can go to of safety and security. Lord, Promises were released and yet more to come for Easter Sunday. Father, we thank you for that. Lord, we just give you thanks for the ordinariness of our lives as well. Thank you for peace in our nation. Thank you for jobs. Thank you for order. Thank you for the services that we enjoy in our ordinary lives. Lord, thank you for your provision for us as a nation. Lord, we are grateful and thankful for all of these things, especially in the light of what we see in our world today, Lord. We want to contend for 
so many of the issues that are taking place around us. Lord, for the war in Haiti, for the terrible, terrible things happening in Sudan, Lord, for all the issues in Nigeria, Lord, for that horrible war in Ukraine. And Lord, we've just been reminded this weekend of the evil that is in men's hearts with this horrible massacre in Moscow, Lord, of these men going in and killing people just for the sake of their religion. Father, our hearts go out to those families who have lost loved ones, who are, Lord, just in shock. Will you come and comfort them, Lord? And then when we think of the Middle East, the mess that is there, Lord, we pray for what's going on in that land, Lord of Israel. Father, both Leviticus and Ezekiel speak of this land as being your land. It is never to be exchanged, never to be sold. The land is holy to you. We recognise that, Lord, a spiritual battle is going on there in the Middle East. We know and pray and told to pray, Lord, for the peace of Jerusalem and know that that peace will never come until Jesus is on his throne reigning here on the earth, Lord. We look forward to that day. Speed that day forward, Lord, and bring that peace that the world looks for. Father, we thank you that countries like Iran, which stir so much trouble in that area, so many people have come out of that nation, have become Christians, have given their hearts to the Lord. Father, we ask and pray that even in the face of such evil, Lord, you bring your people out. Lord, we want to spare a thought for our nation, for our king and his daughter-in-law, for the issues of cancer that they are facing. Lord, for all the issues in their family, we pray for their peace, for their healing. Lord, not just of cancer, but all the rifts that exist. For all the pressure that they're under, we pray for your goodness and your love to flow in their lives. Lord, we pray for this year, with so many things happening with our government, whatever people's political views may be, Lord, we pray that your will would be done in our nation, that, Father, you would bring about the right political party for us as a nation. Continue, Lord, to give us that faith to live life because of you, because of you. Father, give us that faith that makes us strong, that takes fear out of our lives, that instills your peace in our hearts. So Jesus, bless us this day now as we come under your word, as Rich brings that word to us. Bless him, Lord, and instill it within our hearts. We give you thanks as well for the monies that people put into the collection box, for the blessings that brings to us, Lord, and that we could use that money wisely. Now, Lord, feed us on your word, we pray. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand to sing.
Today's reading comes from Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 to 17, and it is about the triumphal entry of Jesus. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, when Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them cloaks and sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who bought and sold in the temple, and he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who, who sold pigeons. And he said to them, It is written, My house will be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes, have you never read? Out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies you have prepared praise. And leaving them, he went out of the city to Bethany and lodged there. Thank you, Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we ask now that you would talk to us and that we would hear your voice and that you would help us. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Uh, quick straw poll. Who likes the Lord of the Rings here? Raise a hand. Okay, good number of you. Uh, has anyone read the Wingfeather Saga? Well, a few of you. A few of you. Excellent. Well, a lot of our great stories, a lot of the myths, the fairy tales, the movies, the, 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 all that stuff, they, they, they oftentimes revolve around or center around a king or a noble prince who is full of justice and truth and bravery and righteousness, and he's going to stand up against a corrupt pretender, a tyrannical ruler of some description. Think of Aragorn and Denethor in Lord of the Rings. Aragorn is the true king. He's humble. He's self-sacrificial. He's patient. He trusts in providence and the greater story. But the imposter, the steward of Gondor, Denethor, he must give way to the greater king when he comes. But he wants to hold on to his power. He appeals to his traditions, to his military setup and to order. And he's so intent on keeping hold of his loaned power that everything starts to fall apart around him. The rule, his rule becomes cruel and oppressive and basically ineffective. If you have read the brilliant Wingfeather saga, in book three, there's this little um, triumphal entry moment. And the true king of Anira, King Kalmar Wingfeather, he arrives in the Green Hollows. The true king is here. But the people, this time, don't accept him. Nor do they expect the king to be as he is. They don't like it. And it's as if the world starts to unravel and fall apart. And all the while you're rooting for this little king to triumph and, and to get the, the recognition he truly deserves. And again, in the book, the moment of revelation when it's like, behold, your king is breathtaking. It's confronting. It's unsettling. It brings fulfillment, but also it is apocalyptic. Apocalypse just means revealing, uh, a revealing and unveiling. Here is truth. Here is your king. It's revealing, it's fulfilling, but it's unveiling and it's unsettling. And here in the story of the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, we have something akin to those stories. Of course, the stories will work because they're riffing off the true story of Jesus. So here in the triumphal entry, Matthew 21 we have the arrival of the true king of Israel. And there is great fervor and interest and intrigue at his arrival. And all that the people must be thinking, like, what is this going to do? What's this mean for us? But it's fair to say it doesn't quite go as expected. Whilst he comes in fulfillment completely, as he does so, he totally upends everyone's thoughts about what that means and what he's here to do and how he's going to achieve it. He, he is not what they would expect. It unsettles the authorities as they seek to hold on to their loaned power. Jesus comes into the story, a story they think they know, and he takes hold of it, all according to prophecy and providence, and he's doing all that the scriptures say he should do. But as we see it happening and playing out, it's so much bigger and brighter and more glorious. The vision that he brings is, it, it, it's enormous. It's completely world changing. It's more beautiful than anything anyone ever could have thought. So for some of the people, as he's unveiled, as this apocalypse happens, for some people, it brings celebration. They realize who he is and who they are and what he's come to do. But for others, they are enraged by his subverting as he fulfills. It is celebration, this moment of apocalypse. It is revealing both of who he is, but who we are and who they are. And we should expect, as we meet Jesus this morning, to be confronted in this way. The light's coming on. Who are you? What are you expecting? Who is Jesus? And what is he going to do for you? 
So let's get into it. The passage begins with something which I guess feels in many ways a little bit mundane. It's all about the travel arrangements, uh, but honestly, it's far from mundane. A couple of the disciples are sent ahead of Jesus um, to find a donkey and the colt, bring them back to the Lord, because he was going to use these to make his entry into Jerusalem. And it says there, if anyone, Jesus says, if anyone asks you what's going on, what do you need these for? He's to say, well, the Lord needs them. And that's hokurios in the Greek. This is the Lord. This is Yahweh. Your God requires these animals. He's not mincing his words. The disciples know who he is now. And so, as incongruous as it may feel for us as we read that God, the Lord, the King, is coming and he's going to ride a donkey. Well, it's not even a proper donkey, is it? It's a little one. It's a foal. It's almost comical in our minds. It doesn't sound right. We, we think surely this triumphal entry should be more like he, he's looking for the great white charger for shadow facts. But, you know, or, or like a, a chariot or a golden carriage or a, I don't know, an armored Rolls Royce or something or a helicopter. That would be far better, wouldn't it? But surprisingly to us, at least, the humble donkey marked since its creation with a cross on its back has been selected and it's always been associated then with royalty and it is the perfect animal for Jesus to arrive on. For the Jewish reader, this ought to be expected transport. In uh, Judges 5, we see Deborah in her song singing about these rulers who ride on white donkeys and sit on carpets, rich cloth, running around like they're ruling the people of Israel. Rulers sitting on donkeys covered with cloth. This sounds familiar, doesn't it? And then in Judges chapter 10, you read on in the book of Judges, Israel's 22-year judge, Jair the Gileadite, and his sons, they all rode on donkeys. Rulers ride donkeys in the Bible. And Saul, the first king of, of national Israel, the first thing he does is he sends his servants to go and find a bunch of donkeys as he's inaugurating the, the old kingdom. So this is transport fit for a king. And here is a king coming to take hold of his kingdom. And of course, this is the exact point that Zechariah is seeking to make here. As Matthew cites from that famous passage in Zechariah chapter 9, all these things, Jesus coming on the donkey into Jerusalem is all happening, he says in verse 4, in fulfillment of Zechariah 9 and telling the people, yes, your king is here. So check it out, check it out in your Bibles. Turn back, it's only 20 pages or something, uh, and keep a finger there, Zechariah chapter 9, or use your palm cross as a bookmark. Zechariah chapter 9, uh, we're going to refer to it quite a bit. Zechariah 9, from verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. This is the bit that Matthew is quoting. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. It's pretty clear, isn't it? Jesus is fulfilling this prophecy, as Matthew says he is. The king is coming in to take hold of his kingdom. And if you were to read the whole of Zechariah 9, it's a pretty wild passage. There's a lot that's going on in there. It's in the genre of apocalyptic scripture, which means it's full of prophecies, it's full of images, and it all feels really dramatic when you read it. It feels like the end of the world kind of stuff. And so with Jesus coming and fulfilling all of this, as Matthew says he is, this is like, what must the people be thinking as they witness this, as they, they see the prophecy kind of coming true? At last, our great Messiah King is here and he's going to sort out all this mess. He's coming in fulfillment and it's judgment time. It's apocalyptic. The proud and the arrogant are going to be put down. The nations are going to be dealt with. The humble poor will be lifted up. And that's all there in Zechariah 9 at the beginning. This is what the people have been longing for. This apocalyptic moment. It's dramatic. It's heroic. The king is going to be unveiled and take his victory. 
That must have been on people's minds as they saw Jesus coming into Jerusalem on the donkey. It is an amazing moment. And, and remember, the crowd that is with Jesus, like, we have to think about this quite carefully. There's a crowd with Jesus, who've been with Jesus, following Jesus for quite some time. They've witnessed his miracles. They've seen Lazarus get raised from the dead. So there's this massive group of people with Jesus. And of course, there's all the people who are already in Jerusalem, the people who live there, the people who've gathered there, because it's Passover week. The city's rammed with pilgrims. Lots of witnesses, loads of people, lots going on. Matthew 21, from verse 6. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put them and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest. The spreading of cloaks on the ground, Second Kings chapter, Second uh, Kings nine verse thirteen. They did this when Jehu was appointed anointed king, and the trumpet sounded, and all the people laid their coats down and proclaimed, "Jehu is king." So this is a great sign that the king is here. That's why they did it. That's why they put the branches and cloaks down. That's why the people are, sound, are shouting here, Hosanna, which means save us. Zechariah 9 clearly says that the king comes to bring righteousness and salvation. Verse 9, the, the verse Matthew quotes, the crowd who are, who are with Jesus, they get it. The saviour is here. Save us. And they call him the son of David, the long-awaited Davidic king. Come who, to, to sit on that throne, the throne of David. He's here. This is tremendous. This is amazing. It's raucous. So Matthew continues, verse 10. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, Who is this? So there's the, the crowd who are coming in with him, making all the noise. And then there's the people in the city. What's going on? What is this commotion? Who is this? Well, the donkey, the Zachariah stuff, what? The crowds said, and this is interesting, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Now what's going on there? Some of the people clearly get what he is, who he is. He's the son of David, come to, to sit on the throne. This is Zechariah 9. The, the prophecies come true. Your king is here, yeah? Save us, O king. The lights have come on. He's been revealed. For some, they get it. But clearly there are some who are like, wait, what? The, you're saying this is the Zechariah 9 thing? No. Do, do, you, do you know what you're invoking with this? Do you know what you're playing with by saying this is happening? You read the whole of Zechariah and you realize there's so much in there. It's talking about grand things, the coming of the Lord, the temple being rebuilt. And then, of course, in their day when the temple was rebuilt, the people were like, well, maybe now we have finished, the Lord will return. He'll put right the situation. They rebuild it, but the Lord doesn't come. So they rebuild the wall, thinking, well, maybe now he'll come. But nothing. And then suddenly it goes quiet, with regards to prophecy at least. For 400 years, no more prophets till John the Baptist. It, it's quiet in the prophetic sense, but it really isn't quiet, quiet in any other sense at that time. There's politics, there's uprisings, there's empires, there's violence. First you've got the Hasmoneans, then you've got the Herodians, then you've got the Romans, you've got the Maccabean Wars. It's crazy. It's kicking off. At the same time, in that period, you've got others claiming to be the Messiah. Rebels like Simon bar Kokhba, other false messiahs who came along and caused huge problem and pain and confusion. So the city, do you see, is understandably nervous 
about what's happening, trying to figure out who Jesus is and like, what are you saying? Messiah? Like, you're not like one of these other guys, are you? What does this mean for us? Verse 12, Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. So this is looking good, isn't it? This is great. This is what was spoken about. The king's coming and he's going to go into his house and he was going to clear it all out and sort it all out for them, put everything in order. It's dramatic. It's all action. He even seems angry. It's on, guys. It's exciting. And he said to them, it's written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. He's doing the thing. He's overturning the tables, driving out the money changers, those inscriptions of Caesar, get them out of my house. Any minute now, they think, the skies are going to be rent open, the lightning's going to strike, the trumpets are going to sound. This is it. That's what they think that's going to happen when the Lord appears. But what does happen next? Verse 14. The blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. You only read this in Matthew and it would be so easy just to miss it. But it's like really significant. The blind and the lame in the temple, at this moment. Well, Matthew, more than any other writer perhaps, has an eye on the Old Testament all the time, looking for the detail, looking for the fulfillment. And there are a couple of places in King David's story in the Old Testament about what happened when he came into Jerusalem. And of course, Jesus is the son of David, as a good number in the crowd have seen. Verse 9, you know, save us, son of David. So when the original David, King David, rides into Jerusalem to take it from the Jebusites, you read this in 2 Samuel chapter 5, we read this. 2 Samuel 5 from verse 6. And the king and his men went to Jerusalem against the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, who said to David, you'll not come in here. The blind and the lame will ward you off. David cannot come in here. Like... They are so sure, the Jebusites, of their onions. They mock David. They think he's so rubbish and weak as a king. Like, you'll never make it into our city, even the blind and the lame. That's who we'll put on the front line. You You won't even get past them. That's how rubbish you are. But David has a plan. A surprise way in to the city. 2 Samuel 5 from verse 7. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion. That is the city of David. Well, what happened then? (laughs) He took it. So David said on that day, whoever would strike the Jebusites, this is the battle plan, let him go up the water shaft to attack the lame and the blind who are hated by David's soul. Therefore it is said, the blind and the lame shall not come into the house. David hated them. He hated the taunt. And so he was determined, they shall be no more. He went in that way and he took them out. They are not welcome. And the saying was true, the blind and the lame shall not come into the house. I'm taking this city, this stronghold, and your blind and lame will not stand in my way. In fact, they will be first to be rid Back in Matthew then. Here is the son of David with his posse riding into Jerusalem. And for sure he storms the city, but unlike David who slaughtered the blind and the lame to rid them from the house of the king, here Jesus gets rid of the blind and the lame by healing them of their blindness and lameness. Jesus' banishment of the blind and the lame from the house is not coming on account of their banishment, but by the banishment of their disease, the curse, those crippling ailments. 
Because King David's greater son is here. This is fulfillment. But it is subversive. The people long for the king to come and put their house in order. And Jesus is doing that. But it's so much more. It's so much bigger. It's so much better and more glorious than what they could have thought. They thought it was all about just killing people and getting rid of the Romans and stuff. And the, and the lame, lame and the blind, oh no, we'll just get them out of the way. They're a bit of a... And Jesus is like, no, I'm here to end the curse. To do so much more than you ever thought. Do you see, this is so much greater. It is apocalyptic. He's doing what the Messiah King ought to do according to the Scriptures, but he's doing it in this life-giving, reordering way by loving and serving and helping and healing, stooping even to the lowest. He fulfills all the prophecies, patterns, types and shadows, but somehow in a richer, greater, more glorious way than anyone could have imagined. It is an unveiling, an apocalypse, a revelation. Your king is here to fulfill, but not how you imagined. Far, far greater, in fact. The king comes humble, riding on a donkey, as Zechariah says. And and in verse 10 of Zechariah 9, well, how big is his kingdom? Well, it's no boundaries. It is from sea to sea, from shore to shore, from the river to the ends of the earth. He comes to bring a peace and a rule and a transformation to the whole world. Matthew 21 from verse 15. So when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David! They were indignant. And they said to him, do you hear what these are saying? Jesus, do you hear them? Do you know what this means? What they're saying about you? You're supposed to be a rabbi, a theologian. Do you hear this? You know the rules about blasphemy? You know the expectations of the people and everything that's happened in the last 400 years? They know that you're not here just to overturn tables, but the entire system... And we've been working so hard to maintain this system. Do you know what you're playing with here, Jesus? You had better stop this and stop it now. We have no idea what the Romans are going to do. And Jesus said to them, Yes, I know what I'm doing. You never read Psalm 8. Love that. You never read Psalm 8. Out of the mouths of of babes and nursing infants, you have prepared praise. In other words, yes, I know what I'm doing. Yes, I know what they're saying. I know all about what this means. Your move. See, when the true king comes, he is always a threat always a threat to those who rule in his name, in his stead. He unmasks them. As much as he is revealing himself, he is unveiling the hearts and lives of everyone in the world. And doesn't Jesus go on to speak in the parables that come up straight after this? The parable of the tenants, verse 33, just look down at this. The stewards, the tenants of the vineyard are given charge while the master's away, but they reject the messengers when they come, one after one, prophet after prophet. Then the son of the owner, the heir himself, comes to the vineyard and they kill him. And Jesus says, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. He knows what he's doing. And verse 43 says, Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. And the one who falls on this stone shall be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. 
when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived he was speaking about them. Or you read on into chapter 22, the parable of the wedding feast. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gives a feast for his son. Again, there's a whole bunch of guests who are invited, but they're all too busy. They mistreat and kill the servants of the king. And then eventually the king's just like, well, all right, well, just go and invite a whole bunch of other people then. The waifs and the strays will bring them in. See, Jesus' judgment and his words now against these authorities, it's arresting, it is brutal, it is apocalyptic. As much as he's being celebrated here by some in the crowd as their true king, simultaneously the tenants are being identified, revealed, and they're ready to be dashed to pieces on the foundation stone of the new temple, his death and resurrection. And it is the blind, and it is the lame. It is the lowly, poor, the humble, the needy, the babes and the infants. They welcome Jesus. They celebrate. They are the fruitful ones. And theirs is the kingdom. So, what does all this have to do with us? be very easy for us as we read this to to point a finger at the scribes and the Pharisees, the rulers, those with religious power, those with a vested interest in holding on. But Jesus comes and he comes now to you. He's here. And he's come to subvert all your thoughts and ideas. He's come to fulfill all your wants and desires as your king. He's going to confront you. The veil's lifted. Here is Jesus. What are you going to do with him? And at the same time, here is you, me. He comes in fulfillment of all your hopes and your dreams, all of your longings and your fears. Jesus is the answer to them all. He is the fulfillment. He is everything you are looking for. Everything you are longing for in this world. But he comes and he overturns the tables in the temple, but also in your life. He won't give you exactly what you think you need. He won't fulfill in the way you think he ought. In other words, everything that you are holding on to to bring fulfillment to yourself, whether that's money or happiness or friends or security, whatever it may be. Maybe it's good things in this world, and they are good. Music, art, poetry, a landscape, the great outdoors, a good book or a movie. All of these things are good things, and you can can put them into your life. Praise God. You, You seek them, you enjoy them, and they do fulfill you briefly. And now what? What next? They don't truly satisfy, do they? So you go on to the next thing. Food and wine and work and sport. And it's all good for a while until it's not. Sometimes it becomes too much, of course. And you become enslaved, mastered by these things as you think they fulfill you. You go to the game, your team loses... You feel unfulfilled, let down, and you look on to the next thing in your life. In other words, you look for the next prophet to ride into Jerusalem, to bring home what you want, to fulfill you in your life, to meet your little expectations, but it doesn't work out. And you kill it. You move on to the next one. And so... Jesus rides into Jerusalem. He confronts us. And at first it looks very much like the one I want, the one who makes sense of everything is here. He's the fulfillment. He's everything I'm longing for. He's riding in on the donkey. It's ticking all the boxes scripturally. And then it starts to get edgy. 
and he's shouty and he's decisive and he's driving people out and sorting out the house and cleaning up the mess. The son of David's here. And then Jesus, standing in the temple courts, calls out, bring the lame and the blind to me. See what Matthew's saying? He's cranking that dial of expectation round. He is turning up the heat. It's all fulfill, 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 fulfill. But then Jesus takes and fulfills it in a way that is so much more glorious. A vision on a way, way bigger than anything we thought. He doesn't shed the blood of his enemies, the blind and the lame, the sinner. Instead, he goes and he sheds his own blood. He will die. And they, we, will be made whole. The curse, blindness, the spiritual blindness, the lameness of our feet because we can't walk and please him. Jesus comes and he he restores it all. He's making us whole. The outcast is being brought in. The waif and the stray dragged in. Do you see, this is fulfillment, but it's subversive. He subverts all our plans and ideas. He takes away all we want and he remakes it in his own way. And by being killed, by dying for them, he, the greatest, now becomes the servant of all. And this is happening every day. There is an apocalypse every day in people's lives. When the king, the hidden king comes and he comes into his temple, he comes into the lives of his people and by his sacrificial death, he transforms and he remakes, he restores, he heals. Those he should kill and cast out, he makes alive and he says, you're my child, I love you. Today is Palm Sunday, a day of celebration. Here is the king. He's come in fulfillment, fulfillment of scripture, of prophecy. It's great, the plans, it's all being unveiled. He's here and and, and there's a fulfillment of our desires and our wants and and everything. He's going to save us. But friends, when he comes, he's going to turn the tables over. He's going to turn things upside down for you and it'll feel like the end of the world. He will take hold of your life and he will smash you down on the cornerstone. And he will pull you limb from limb. And then he will remake you. He will take your life. And he will bring fulfillment, change, glory, beauty and goodness from what was broken. He will restore you. He will love you and keep you. As he dies for you to pay for your sin, the curse upon him, not upon you. He takes it away. The wrath upon him, not upon you. So you'd have nothing to fear. And your king sets you on a new path. And you can see. And you can walk. Because he has changed everything for you. There's an everyday apocalypse when we meet Jesus. He reveals the state of the world. He reveals the state of your life and your heart. He reveals the state of Israel, the rulers and the people. He shows us who he truly is. And it's confronting, it's arresting. But he's here to save. He's here to transform. And it's a mess, a bloody mess on Good Friday. But it's a glorious end on Easter Sunday. Amen. Let's pray. Father, as we're confronted by Jesus, he's just amazing. In the way he reveals our hearts and our lives, in the way he deals with our expectations and our fears and our longings, he makes us whole. He renews and restores Lord, thank you that he doesn't kill. Thank you that he saves. 
Oh Lord, as we're confronted today with Jesus, may we be those like the little ones, uncomplicated praise and thankfulness that our King is with us and that we are made right through his death and resurrection. Build us onto the cornerstone, our whole lives, our whole future. Father, we thank you for sending Jesus. And as we look forward to Easter weekend, oh Father, keep opening our eyes to him, to ourselves, to the reality of the world, so that we could keep on proclaiming that Jesus is our King and our beautiful Saviour. Amen. We're going to sing, and uh, as we uh, sing this next hymn, uh, we are going to distribute the elements for the Lord's Supper. If you know the Lord Jesus, if you trust him, if you're following him, you're welcome to take the bread and the wine with us. If you're not there yet, we are glad you're here, confronted by Jesus, but the bread and wine won't save you. Jesus will. The bread and wine point to him. So just let those go by, and we're just glad you're here. Let's sing together. Oh, that's better. There we are. How about that? 
Well, as we come now to the Lord's table, uh, once again we are being confronted. There's a revealing, an unveiling, an apocalyptic moment with all the drama you'd expect. A little piece of bread. Do you see we're in the territory of this subversion and the fulfillment? How does a little bit of bread tell us about Jesus? That doesn't seem right. It's a bit like a king sitting on a foal. <laughs> a little bit of bread. But the bread helps us to remember Jesus' whole life, full and glorious, how he feeds us. He also, it also reminds us as, as church how he feeds us. Because we share in one loaf. We're all part of one body. He feeds us. He doesn't just feed me. He feeds us. So he's building. He's creating. He's drawing us in. And how does this little cup, this tiny thimble of wine, how does this preach to us and confront us and subvert all our ideas? Well, here is something that tells us that Jesus' blood covers over all our sin. All of it. So if you're nervous, if you think, if you forget, if you're feeling guilty, and you look at this cup and you think, I'm unholy, I'm unworthy. Of course you are. In one sense, you have no reason to walk up to the Lord and say, give me everything. No, you only have what you have because he gave it to you. But because you're his child, and because you drink this cup, all the sins that trouble your conscience, you're reminded, ah, they're washed away. Believe it, friends. They're gone. And he's not angry with you. The wrath passes over when the blood is applied. So it's only little, comically small piece of bread <laughs> and a tiny little cup. But what it says is so amazing, so confronting. So glorious, taking your life and saying to you, I feed you. I, ma I make you whole. You don't make yourself whole, I make you whole. Take and eat the bread. Your sin, gone. Believe it. It's been dealt with at the cross. Two simple elements proclaiming such wonderful things. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So as we head into Easter week and we think of that last supper, in its build-up to the cross and resurrection. We've been reminded here of the bread. We've been reminded that Jesus says, this is my body, take and eat and remember me. Let us now give thanks for the bread, just as the Lord instructed, and remember him. Thank you, Father, for this bread broken for us, distributed to us, your people. Feed us and fill us afresh with Jesus, we pray. Raise our faith as you have raised this bread. Fill our lives with the bread of Christ. Amen. Let us eat together. In the same way, he also took the cup 
after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. So as we consider then this cup and all it means, as we shortly give thanks to it, as we remember our sin, as we remember the body of the Lord, we also remember the body of Christ here. And as we think of those in this place, we remember actually if Jesus loves them, if Jesus has paid and his blood's been applied, I love them too. So we discern the body together. Let's give thanks now for the cup. Father, we thank you for giving us this cup that your son drank the cup of wrath, poured out full strength at sin. And we are instead given a cup of sheer blessing, a cup of life, a cup that marks us as those under a new covenant, enjoying the blessings and benefits of being your people, chosen, redeemed, made whole. And so, Lord, as we drink this cup now, may its blessings be renewed in our faith, in our hearts and minds, of forgiven sin, of life forevermore, of being held eternally as children. Amen. Let us drink. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for the feast of your word this morning. Your word read and preached. Your word visually communicated, physically, through the elements of bread and wine and eating and drinking together. Increase our faith, Lord. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. May we walk as those made right seeing with eyes of faith all the wonderful things that you've done for us. And as we remember the greater body, Lord, we acknowledge we're part of the body of Christ as Christians, each members of it. And so, Lord, as there are those this morning who are unable to gather and receive the elements and for us to just be visually, really practically visually reminded of each other. Lord, they're not here this morning through ill health, infirmity, old age. Maybe some are visiting away. Lord, you know them all and you know their needs. You know their lives, their troubles. Father, we pray that as they look to Jesus... May they see that he is the fulfillment of all their joys and all of their desires, the fulfillment of all of their lives. If they're infirm, Lord, may they see him as their sure foundation. If they are unwell, may they see him as their deliverer and healer. As they are lowly in heart, in spirit, exhibiting a great poverty of life. May they look to him, the one who is the fullness of life and joy, who is the lover of our souls. Father, bless us. Bless us all who are gathered here this morning. So that as we go into this week with its 
remembrances as we consider Jesus and all that he's done. Lord, as we look forward to celebrating together and mourning together and having that emotional roller coaster of Good Friday and Holy Saturday and the joy of Easter Sunday, Lord, we pray that by your Spirit, we would be drawn close to Jesus, our crucified and risen Saviour, and know his life more and more. And we pray this in his powerful name. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing again. Let's stand and sing. sings 
And so, having proclaimed your greatness, we join with the angels and declare you to have all power, all dominion, all authority, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please take your seats. We've got tea and coffee here and also in the foyer. And uh, if you're joining us for the baptismal classes, five minutes or so, grab yourself a drink and then we'll head out uh, in the back hall.